Welcome everybody here from Tomorrow Biostasis. I want to give you a brief overview of three landmark papers that we have published over the last couple of years describing individual points that show that cryopreservation, in certain circumstances at least, already works quite well and gives an indication, gives kind of almost like a proof of principle, proof of concept, that the fundamental parts of what would be needed for cryopreservation and then also bringing back people from cryostasis is in fact fundamentally at least possible. So the first paper that I would briefly like to discuss is a paper that showed that if you cryopreserve a kidney, a kidney of a rabbit, fully down to cryogenic temperatures and then bring them back from cryogenic temperatures to, well, 37 degrees about. I'm actually not 100% sure what the exact uh, temperature of, a, of a, the body temperature of a rabbit is, but at least bring them back to the body temperature of a rabbit. Then transplant that kidney, be, kidney back into the rabbit. The rabbit survives. So basically the kidney survives the whole process of full cryopreservation, full vitrification, and then de-vitrification. And in the end, it was shown that it actually works. Now, of course, in cryopreservation, it's quite common that the size of what you would like to cryopreserve is quite important for how good, how good the quality of cryopreservation is. So while it is possible to cryopreserve rabbit kidneys, which are relatively small, it is not yet possible to cryopreserve larger organs, for example, human organs. But nevertheless, it shows that organs can fully survive, in quotation marks, the cryopreservation procedure. The second paper is showing that not only organs can be cryopreserved and then be brought back, but you can cryopreserve full organisms, model organisms that are quite commonly used in you know, research in labs. And in this, that case, in this case, it is C. elegans, which is a small worm, where it was shown that when you cryopreserve C. elegans and then bring C. elegans back and kind of revive C. elegans, the worm continues to live on. But that wasn't even the most interesting part. The most interesting part from that paper was that the worm keeps its memories. And of course, now I'm the first to admit that a worm memory is something different than a human memory. But fundamentally, you can show that the, the, the memory that is encoded in the neural structure, in the connections of the brain of the worm, or at least the neural structure, that these connections that were learned during the life of the worm, it's kind of showing that, it, that the memory was an, an aversion to certain chemicals, that that part stays around after bringing back someone from, well, not someone, but the worm from cryostasis. Kind of, again, showing kind of a proof of principle, even though very early and only in small organisms, that it is potentially possible to remain, retain the memories after cryostasis, which of course would be very, very important in humans as well. While that is possible in the worm, a lot of research is still needed to show that that is also possible in humans. And last but not least, one paper where it was shown that if you use a certain type of cryopreservation, so-called aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation, which is a combination of a fixation with aldehyde, with glutaraldehyde, and cryopreservation with a cryoprotective agent, if you combine these two things and do it in a certain, a certain way, that then once, um, and here in this case it was done with neural tissue, that after this whole procedure you can show that the neural structure, the ultrastructure, meaning the inside parts of the, of the cells, of the neurons, are basically looking um, like they look if you would have done that in, in a you know, kind of in a, in a research setting um, for uh, for preservation or standard methods of preservation for neural structures. So while these three papers definitely do not prove that cryopreservation in humans is possible or will ever be possible, they do show that at least in principle the individual parts that would be required to make it possible in humans are you know at least some indications that they will be possible or might be possible at some point in the future. I've linked all three papers in the comments below. Feel free to check them out yourself and see what was possible and what was able to be shown in these landmark papers.